Hi, everyone. I understand that I'm between you and beer in that serious business here in this part of the world. So we'll try to... So, apologies. Uh, this will be a, uh, I hope not too much, but information-dense information uh, presentation. But I think the topic uh, is itself uh, complex enough. So, too many words there. We're going to co cover specifically uh, load shedding and what it is. Uh, and then the impact on how you should do traffic management and also the impact on the service, how to manage services. So, uh, one minute overview of Google Stack. Why are you going to be talking load chatting? You know, some principles, some techniques, and also then as had impact on service management. So, how does Google uh, look like internally? Um, so, basically, we have a very distributed uh, uh, application environment where uh, everything comes through uh, a Google front end, the GFE, uh, and then an application which says that green box uh, has multiple servers. They all talk with, it, with each other um, uh, using uh, RPC. Uh, you now know there's a public uh, implementation called gRPC. Uh, and then typically applications are structured with a front end, a back end, and then they call, uh, uh, then they call another storage layer or another back end. And those themselves uh, are, up, you know, boxes like that. So, and this happens in many, many layers. Uh, I think every click that you do probably crosses, you know, 5, 10, 20 of these boxes before then you get a, a reply, right? Uh, the biggest difference is structurally uh, from a lot of the applications uh, stacks out there is that we do load balancing uh, in every single of those hops. Right, at, at, at every of those hops, not just at the beginning of the stack, but every single of those connections is load balanced, uh, and I quick, you know, nicely abstracted that away in a single LB box. But it's not that. Okay, so why are we discussing load shedding? Um, because this happened in 2009. I was a, a SRE manager for Gmail, um, and then uh, there were there was a bad year. We had three global outages. I don't know if you remember, but I do. Uh, those were not good days. Um, and the, global, the, the outages were different reasons, but uh, at, at, you know, at the core, uh, there, were, there was this one specific server uh, service that um, caused one of the outages, uh, magnified another of the outages, and had, you know, and was hammered in the third of the outages. So uh, I was actually the incident manager uh, for one of the, the biggest outages, actually, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, so I was in, you know, front page of BBC News for my 15 minutes of fame. Not good. Um, and then as a reward, they gave me the service that uh, was causing the problems. So the first thing that we did, we did what we can do at Google, which is out of the reach of a lot of people, which is we threw money at the problem, we threw resources, we threw machines, you know, we got a lot of uh, hardware to actually scale this service. But then we went about, okay, how are we gonna solve this from a software engineering point of view? So the, what you guys are gonna hear today is the outcome of seven years of work. Um, so the, three, the timeline, you know, three uh, Gmail global outages. Uh, we did the first implementation in 2010 and ever since we've been generalizing and we're learning a lot. So, uh, what are the threats to the service? And the biggest threat is the intern. Specifically, when you get an intern, you give them a nice MapReduce framework, and you give them one of those, or several of those, right? You basically have an intern distributed denial service attack, <laughs> right? right. Uh, i give you an example. Uh, we had uh, uh, not too long ago an intern that uh, was asked to do a load testing, um, and he wanted to test uh, Gmail uh, specifically. And we have a nice tool, command line, and you specify, you know, 15,000 uh, requests per second, something like that, and he just, uh, you know, just run that thing from his workstation. You know, what 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 harm can be done? Uh, the problem is that we, we were Google, right, and our units are not ones. Our units are thousands. So he was actually running a 15 million, uh, you know, load testing event. Uh, so that had, the, you know, unintended consequences. 
Um, but I'm, I'm joking, right? This is, this, is, this is actually a pattern. It happened quite a few times, but it's just a generalization of a broader things, you know? So you effectively have three types of uh, attacks uh, or threats. Uh, one of them is a single task overload. Effectively, this is the biggest concern. You know, tasks get overloaded all the time for very different reasons because load balance is never perfect. Um, nowadays, you know, we have a lot of people working in this domain, but you can never really predict, you know, the cost of a specific query. You know, not all the queries have the same cost, and just by distributing traffic, even if you do like round robin, uh, you know, the, the, the load in a task is, is never perfectly distributed across all the tasks. Um, we also have antagonistic uh, uh, tasks, like you have, a, you have a process running on a machine and then something else uh, runs on the same machine, it's, you know, that task is going to run slower than a task that doesn't have an antagonistic load. And even things like, a, like if you're running Java, Java has, you know, generically speaking, uh, potentially more buzz memory contention than, for instance, C++ job. If you have run two Java binaries in the same uh, machine, you may have a little bit more contention. Or one of the machines uh, has an hyper-threaded CPU, and the other machine does not have hyper-threading, so the hyper-threading CPU might have a little bit more memory con uh, contention. So uh, the baseline is you can never trust. Never trust, uh, and single tasks can get overloaded. Uh, at the other extreme, you know, you can actually have the whole service is overloaded, you know, uh, and this happens not just at Google, everywhere. If you uh, misgauge uh, or misplan uh, uh, the, the, the capacity that you need to serve your service, and then more people than you expect arrive, or if the work that you're doing is more expensive than you thought, or if the, 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 um, the developer in that specific service makes a feature that is more costly that wasn't there, suddenly you actually don't have capacity. And then your service can be overloaded. Uh, at Google, it sometimes happens because we do launches, and there's quite a bit of people interested in that. And so suddenly, if there's like a New York Times or in a Google I.O. Uh, launch, and then you know, 50 million people show at the same time, and then we can actually have a service overload post for, for a launch. Uh, somewhere in the middle, there are uh, Overloads that happen just if you're in a cluster. So at Google, we deploy applications in many clusters. Uh, and it's possible that a single cluster is overloaded, but not the, the, the overall service. And this happens, uh, for instance, in scenarios where you have batch jobs that, uh, you know, just because of the nature, you want to run e efficiently, so ro rolling the data locally and writing to the local storage. And then they only use the, the service in a specific cluster. So that cluster is going to be overloaded, but the rest isn't. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a layers, uh, uh, you know, less common uh, uh, in type overload. So because of those threats, we've learned a lot of things, and we actually distilled them down to a few of the principles. Um, and before I go there, you know, just this is what a traffic pattern looks. Uh, the units don't matter. It's a big number. Uh, QPS is uh, queries per second, but as you see, there's clearly a pattern uh, there. You can see the weekdays versus the weekends, right? Uh, that peak is around 4, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., depending on the time zone uh, changes uh, of European time, so uh, CET, um, because it all, you know, combines, and it's super predictable. But sometimes you actually have events that, uh, that disrupt. And you need to plan for the peak. Right? So this is what capacity planning uh, for that, you know, I abstracted the way into a nice uh, sinusoidal curve. So this is how we plan a service capacity at Google, right? We know that, we know that curve, we know the peak, you know, we put a safety margin on top, um, and that's how many CPUs that get reserved for a specific job. Uh, but if you have an outage, like if a cluster disappears or if a set of machines disappear, then suddenly your capacity is below your peak. And if it happens uh, during the trough, you know, at, uh, when it's not peak, that's fine. You, you don't notice. But if it happens at the peak, we have a problem. Right? So that's the typical uh, service uh, overloaded uh, problem. Um, another aspect is... Uh, uh, people are aware uh, and familiar with the hockey, keeps, uh, hockey uh, uh, stick curve. Um, 
And, and, and what happens if you look at latency over, over a QPS on a task, you load test, and you'll see that's almost linear depending on your software, depending on, on your contention. It's pretty much linear until a certain point. And after a certain point, it just goes um, And you have end up with high latency. Uh, so from a product perspective, from a user perspective, uh, if something takes 30 seconds to return, it's, as, it's, it's down, right? Uh, but what people also don't talk is, uh, uh, after a certain load, tasks will actually die, you know, or become trash to the point they actually stop responding, which is their same as that. So your capacity actually goes to zero uh, on the task. And what happens is, since that task is dead, that traffic goes somewhere, so it goes to another task. So the, task, the, the, the other tasks are also overloaded. Now they need to handle their traffic plus the new traffic. And they'll get overloaded and they'll die. So what happens is that now the, 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 ta the, the load of those two tasks go to other tasks, and then now yeah, they, they have to handle four, right? So then you end up with a cascading failure. And this is what happened in 2009. Uh, different reasons, different bugs, different problems, but this is what happened. And the biggest one actually uh, brought down Gmail completely around the world, every single one of them which is actually a, a fairly difficult uh, uh, instance to happen. So, so these are the principles that we uh, develop over time. So the first one is actually the most important one, uh, which is sustain peak performance. And we're gonna cover that, uh, which means like make sure they survive. The second one is about isolation, making sure that problems in one customer traffic don't impact another. Criticality is something that we've learned over time. Work conserving, which is even after you put all the barriers, if you can, you can estimate, you can do the work, still do it. Uh, Cost-based instead of query PS, we'll cover that, and also reach wise. So what does it mean for all, all of this? Sustained peak performance. Basically the baseline is we want to survive uh, all the time. So, and this means actually making tough decisions. Uh, always serve the maximum capacity the task has, uh, and this means like, not crashing. Uh, don't go above what the task can do within the latency constraint that you want to do. Uh, and this might mean rejecting traffic. And this is a notion that uh, you know, some people uh, have difficulty, right? They want to you know, serve all the requests. So they, they, you know, the idea uh, that they, they, they want to uh, you know, reject a, a request and not you know, serve an error, is, uh, is anathema for them. But this is a very important one because this is what stops cascading failures. Um, isolation is sort of obvious, you know, uh, hard to implement, but is a principle that we want to, 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 to keep at, uh, um, at, at, you know, for all of our services because we also have, you know, our services are built on top of other services and so we, those are the customers of the backend services uh, and we want to have some isolation and quotas and, and, and maintain all of that. Um, this, the third aspect is, is around criticality. And this comes from the insight that we had that not all traffic is as the same importance. Right? So abstractly, uh, we've worked, you know, we had you know, maybe three, maybe five, maybe six, and we sort of worked into four levels. And those levels are basically critical, traffic that is shadable, we can you know, get, get away with, traffic that is asynchronous, and traffic that is batch, batch in the sense of pipelines, map reduces, that sort of thing. So if you are able in your application to classify the traffic that comes into these sort of four buckets, then you can start using, uh, you know, in, in interesting ways. So we come with this idea with criticality. And criticality, we develop the priority bands, and then we actually have well defined semantics for each one of them. And they are prop the important thing is they are propagated through the stack. So right now, uh, we are able to, to, to track like from the front end of the click down to storage. If your click or if the, that request is associated to end user critical, or if it's just Gmail on the background resyncing the data or another application, so that's asynchronous traffic, you know, if that doesn't, uh, uh, refresh, you don't, you, you don't even notice, so we can we get away with it. Uh, or if it's uh, actually a batch running a, a report on the back end, right? Uh, and if you have these different, uh, different types of traffic, you can uh, act on them differently. 
So what happens is if you bring those two together uh, during an outage, you know, if you are prioritizing your traffic, you can uh, drop and not serve traffic that is not user visible, not user critical, right? because you won't notice. Um, if you have two machines and one of them die, you can still serve 50% of your traffic. And if 50% of your traffic are actually the user, you know, that what the user see, you know, you, you, you're golden, right? Nobody knows that you had an outage. Uh, uh, if you take these two at the extreme, you don't even have to page. As we have actually had the incidents uh, uh, at Google where one, serv one service uh, had like a full cluster outage, so a significant percentage of their capacity was lost, but because uh, all that uh, traffic that was being shed was uh, on the sort of batch uh, load, you know, who cares? You know, the cluster will be back. There's another set of people that are doing their work. Um, not, a, not an emergency, right? So, another principle is around work conserving, which is, uh, it's, it's a fairly interesting thing, but actually uh, limits the sort of incidents that you know, uh, that the technology itself might introduce. Because one of the problems, like once you introduce like load shedding, where you say, I want to reject traffic, uh, if somebody makes a mistake in configuration, uh, if they make, for instance, quotas which are too tight for a service, or for instance, if the service uh, um, is growing unexpectedly and the product manager has forgotten that, you know, to request more quota for his service, uh, then, you know, they have a launch and uh, suddenly they're getting throttled, so they're throwing errors for the users. Uh, and and that's, that's unnecessary if the service, the backend, still has capacity. So we've come up with this uh, approach where we always give generous, uh, generous uh, default quotas, uh, but on top of that, if a service is using more capacity than what they have uh, requested their quota, if the task has, like this is a local uh, per, uh, per task decision, if the task has the capability to serve it, we'll serve it, you know. It's a, world, you know, it's a free world. Uh, also, a big, a big change that has happened over the last 10 years at Google is we've, moved, we've changed from QPS, queries per second, to CPS, cost per second. And this is primarily because um, when, when Google was started, most of the tools were, you know, built for search. Search has a very interesting pattern the way they architected, that, that meant that uh, the, 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 every query was, was modeled and the system was modeled so that the queries had a very uniform cost in the beginning. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we now have applications uh, on the social space, we have circles. So if you ask for uh, my friends ordered by priority ranking, uh, it's gonna be a very cheap query on the profile system because I have no friends. Uh, but if you ask for the same query for Britney Spears, it's going to be a problem because she has 10, 000, uh, sorry, 10 million uh, followers. Um, so you see that the same query can have a very different cost just based on the data that is being applied to it. Right? And it's impossible to predict what the cost is going to be because you need to know the data. But to know the data is basically solving the request itself. So. Um, we need to move. We need to move uh, away from uh, from QPS to CPS, and a lot of teams at Google, you know, keep learning this in a very painful way. Um, the final uh, aspect is retries. So, if you say I'm going to reject traffic, uh, you need also to embrace retries, and that means that the next layer up needs to embrace the fa the fact that the, the backend will throw errors and then you'll retry somewhere else. Um, most of engineers leave university with this impression that errors never happen. Uh, I have an, a very nice slide, not for this presentation, that shows how many things happen in a, in a cluster in the first year of life, and it's horrendous. Uh, and we, we, we give this to the Nooglers, and basically the message is everything fails all the time, so you need to, uh, to, pl to code uh, uh, defensively. Um, but once you accept that there will be problems, then you can use it. So then you need to embrace retries. And the retries are a very powerful tool, but also uh, need to be done very carefully because you might be actually amplifying the problem. We had a situation with an uh, Hangout system once where you know, we had some level of traffic and uh, we actually got 50 times 
the traffic uh, during an outage because people, um, you know, because the, the sessions were poorly uh, implemented and the retry just made it uh, many times worse. This is also a very common problem in mobile because uh, people that program in, in mobile really forget that these things synchronize. Uh, there might be synchronization artifacts and then the backends get overloaded and what you do, you retry the request to the backend and suddenly your company is down. So, uh, I just mentioned one of the hardest concepts to accept is actually retries uh, because the, back, the service owner says, oh, but you know, I really don't want to serve errors to my client. And the layer up is like, oh, my backend is returning errors. I need to code around it. Uh, but there's an important aspect to it, which is if you fail fast very quickly, you actually uh, statistically, uh, and if you fail fast quickly and you retry quickly, and if you're talking inside of a, of a, cl of a cluster, you know, of a, of a data center, this can be done in, you know, in one millisecond. Uh, if you're not using XML or you know, JSON, if you actually use like a protocol buffer and gRPC binary protocol sort of thing, um, which is quick, then you can actually, uh, you know, basically it's like a, a, almost a test. Like, you know, are you there? Can you give me a reply? If you're not, I'm gonna try another task. And then suddenly, like because of all of this unevenness on, on, the, on the backend tasks, you sort of even them out and the, you get a, a drastic reduction on um, and what's called tail latency. Tail latency is the, the latency of the very small percentage of, of, of requests that, that are, very, uh, are very slow. And also, this is what's called the micro failover. Like each process is basically connected to a bunch of backends and it's choosing, you know, basically avoiding the ones which are sick. Um, but basically also means that, you know, every after service always has a very small, steady, like basal rate of, uh, you know, task throttling. I hope you guys are with me so far. Uh, so techniques. Very abstractly, uh, when you have a client that connects to a server, there's only so few points where you can control you know, uh, stuff. You can either intervene there, so on the client side, or on the server side, or you can put a proxy and intervene there, or you know, there's variations. You know? you can actually proxy but wrapper the client side because that, that way you don't, uh, you, you don't uh, change the code, it's just wrapped up in, in, a, in a nice uh, you know, envelope or you can uh, wrap the back end and do the same thing, your code doesn't change, so it's a system level wrap up or you can just go all in and then you wrap both the inbound and the outbound on the front end and the outbound on the, on the back end. So, so this is how you can do some very interesting things. Uh, on the client side, there's different techniques. One of them, uh, somebody just asked me uh, around request hedging, which is sending multiple requests to multiple backends and then getting the one that is faster. Uh, this is an interesting technique, but can only be used on uh, immutable requests and item potent requests because you don't want to increase someone else's bank account twice. Uh, when they do a deposit. Uh, it also has a cost, right? Because for every request, there's a, there's a similar cost on the back end. So it's not to be used uh, trivially. But uh, in some areas, especially for critical performance, uh, you know, read-only sort of application is, is, is fantastic. Uh, if you want to make sure that you have like, a, a low latency. Another thing I mentioned before about like looking at the tasks which are not overloaded, uh, there's this concept and, and uh, gRPC actually introduced this API now it's called a channel picker. You know, a channel is you connect to several backends. You have a currently established connection that's called a, cha a channel. Uh, and then, at, for every message that you want to send, before you send it, you pick which of the channels you're going to send the message through. And the basic one is just round the robin. Uh, uh, there's things that you can actually say. Well, this is the average of the latency of the replies over the last, you know, say five replies from my backend from each one of them and I'm gonna pick the one that is, uh, you know, the lowest, right? And this keeps uh, adjusting the statistics. Um, you can also do another technique in terms of like retries, as you mentioned before. You know, you can retry aggressive on the same task, you can retry in a different task, you can retry in a different task in a different cluster if you have that sort of topology. Uh, you can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, and this along, you know, heartbeat and health checks, 
Uh, I think that some of you as well are familiar with the circuit breaker pattern uh, and rate limiting and uh, max request implied. So those two uh, are not good uh, because they're all based on the assumption that you can actually model the request cost and you know as I mentioned before request costs are our problem. So that's the technique that is actually quite available in the summer of tools, and I'll talk about them before uh, later. But uh, it is something that uh, you know I particularly don't li don't like. If you um, have to choose between those two, choose the max request implied because it actually it's 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 better than the rate limiting because the rate limiting, uh, you know, you can say like 100 requests per second, but actually it doesn't say you know if the task is actually loaded or not. Um, you know, because it doesn't, it doesn't have a control of how many of them actually have been dispatched. So the, the max request in flight is better because it at least is the current state, has a notion of current state. Um, so the top one are very interesting, good techniques, but they don't actually help in overload situation, and retries actually make it worse. Uh, this, this is minimal, just check if it's there. Um, and as I mentioned before, like the client side rate limit, it just lacks finesse. If the threshold is too high, you misgaged and it's, you know, and you have an overload. Uh, if the threat is too low, basically your task is empty and it's not, you know, so you have wasted, uh, uh, you paid for the hardware, but it's not, you know, being used. Um, also, it has an interesting uh, effect, which is uh, if you're sending five Britney Spears qu uh, queries, uh, they're very low. I mean, you know, you can kill a task with one query, so uh, because they're costly. Uh, at the same time, if you send a, a, a barrage of Akasi queries, uh, you know, the, there's nothing, nothing, nothing to be done. So rate limiting. I hope you understand why I don't like it. I don't think it's enough. Uh, circuit breaker. I mentioned this before. You know, just a refresher. What what it is. Um, but the problem with client side, including circuit breaker pattern, platform, uh, pattern, is that all you need is to have a single client of yours that does not have uh, that technique, and then suddenly your backend, you know, will kill you. Right? It's always the one, uh, and this means that if you can't control all your developer environment because you all have legacy, uh, you know, client side load shedding is not enough. So. Uh, there's a further problem, which is, you know, if you have multiple uh, uh, types of connection, you know, like we have RPC, we have Mongo, we have Redis, we have MySQL, these all have different connection types, you know, how to handle all of these client variations, it's, 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 it's an issue. Uh, so, what we've opted to do, at, you know, with my team is to actually focus on server-side load shedding, which is, we don't care what the client is doing, we're going to make a local decision and make sure that, uh, that, that, that uh, it's working. And just to understand on the stack, like imagine that we have a server running, and by, by the way, the server is software. Um, we, you know, the request comes through the RPC layer, we apply throttling at that level at the earliest possible processing time before any business logic. Then we have a generic you know, software framework that, uh, that my team is working on, and then there's a business logic. So we reject requests that can be handled safely. Remember the first principle about always surviving? That's the, uh, you know, that's where it's, the decision is made. So the request doesn't even get seen by the business logic at all. Instrumentation sees it, right? There's a request uh, that monitoring the, that, 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 that collects statistics, but besides that, nothing else. So server-side techniques. We have rate limiting again. We can do max requesting flight. And that this can be uh, from single request, simple request count, or uh, you know, token of uh, token buckets. And here the idea is that you sort of have a rough model of uh, the complexity of some queries versus others. For instance, uh, a simple technique is basically to have an in-memory map, you know, keeping with the circles. Uh, example, Britney Spears and me, you can have like a hash of the number of contacts that, uh, that a person has to so keep it in memory. And if the query comes for Britney Spears, there's a large number, assign 100, bucket, 100 uh, tokens. But if it's a Casio, you know, very few contacts, 
just estimate that I'm going to be like one, buck, one token, stuff like that. Uh, we also can have like the weighted in-flight request, which is slightly different. It's basically almost a, a mix of the, those two models. Um, also, another way is called executor uh, load average, and by executor, I'm talking about you know uh, threads or fibers, and you know you just know how many of them are running, how many are available, and based on that, sort of gauge the 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 the, the, the load in the task. Um, there's an interesting uh, technique as well for event loop-based uh, uh, environments where you just you have a a latency monitor that checks when it, you know, it's basically something that, that is put on top of the event loop, records the time, and then puts itself again on the event loop and just monitors until how long it, it takes until it gets back there. This is very useful for, uh, for instance, for Node.js. Um, and, and if it's getting too long, that means there's all the work that the task is doing is just too, too long for the, uh, for, the, for the task and, you know, ease off. Uh, other areas where we actually can measure is a memory utilization, so memory pressure and CPU utilization, like raw, raw CPU utilization, if you can have that. So the even better model is if you actually make a composite of all of this, because usually depending on the load, on the, on the, on the task, you know, the, not, not uh, every single one of these will catch overload situations. So if you actually make a composite, you measure all of them, and then you, you make a, a little composite that, that uh, all of these things actually have a better result, and it's the max of all of the delegates, for instance. Uh, so we compute the task load, hopefully in, you know, expressly in real time, accurately, and we do this uh, on a per request basis, so individually, right? So we have one request going to the task. If you have 10 requests, all of that load is being uh, measured uh, uh, separately. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, like the max uh, rate limit versus max in flights are going to, you know, one or better way is actually use the token base if you, wanna, if you can only use that. And um, there's also one, one, one aspect which is you don't go from everything is okay to, oh my God, I'm overloaded. Uh, you kind of ease into that. So we've learned that uh, uh, we start applying some like, pressure before you start hitting, you know, uh, overload situations. And what you do is you combine soft limits and hard limits with uh, criticality. So for a certain amount, let's say 80% of load or 75% of load, you allow everything. Um, if you go above, let's say, 90% of the task capacity, uh, you uh, only allow critical. And in between, you sort of probabilistically, uh, you know, you know uh, apply the, the, the throttling starting with, uh, you know, the batch and then the, the non-interactive and then the shareable and then the critical if things get that bad. So, um, I talk about generic approach, but, you know, you specifically can't use the Google solutions. So, you know, what can you do? Uh, what's out there? So, starting at the very simple layer, uh, HAProxy, it's a very interesting uh, high-performance uh, pro proxy. I actually use it on, on, my, on my private uh, projects. Uh, but it's in terms of uh, semantics, it's very simple, right? So, it does, uh, you know, max, max in flights request, it has L checking, and it does sort of, you know, secret, circuit breaker in it. Uh, if you're doing nothing else, it's already great because it, this is very low latency, so you can even put it in between all of the, the connections. It does a TCP, it does HTTP, HTTP2, um, so it's actually quite flexible and very super simple to configure. There's things like Varnish, which are that, but super souped up, and they have similar uh, L4 uh, capabilities. Um, on the software level, you know, if, if you are in the in the uh, Scala, Java sort of world. Akka is interesting because they even have implementations of Circuit Breaker. And uh, gRPC is, you know, that Google is, come, is, 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 is open sourced. You know, we're, my team is actually working with the gRPC team. And we're trying to, to uh, bake a lot of these functionalities, capabilities directly into the RPC layer. So that, you know, retries, exponential backoff, that sort of thing that goes into uh, 
into gRPC. Uh, for instance, there's a load balancing API. There's also a channel picker API inside of the load balancer, so you can even make your uh, load balancing implementations. Uh, there's an interesting, for instance, rate limit implementation that Lyft has done, uh, and it also can do like uh, in, with a gRPC uh, service. Uh, I, I mentioned before I don't like rate limit, but you know, when it, we, we can't have a, if you don't have a dog, you hunt with a cat. Uh, more interesting is actually a token-based implementation uh, by Juju. Uh, they call it rate limit, it's actually a token-based. Uh, and they have this like steady rate where you fill tokens, like you replenish the bucket at a certain rate, and then each request, request takes out of that. And if the bucket is empty, you just, you don't uh, accept the request. And it's uh, a Go-based library, and it has very nice uh, IO reader, IO writer interfaces, so it just fits in very well with, uh, with the Go uh, environment. Uh, if you remember the, my, my the slide where I had like the deploying technique with the envelope sort of thing, uh, there are two basically, there are basically two uh, solutions that, uh, that uh, we, I found very interesting and Google has uh, adopted, uh, especially in our cloud environment. Uh, Envoy, which is something that Lyft um, developed. Um, Envoy takes the approach of just wrapping the, the, the environment and proxying. And in it, they do not just load chatting, they actually have service discovery, they have circuit breaker, they have a bunch of things. Uh, because they, they are an environment that is probably familiar with, the, with a lot of you where they had legacy PHP, Python, and new stuff, and they wanted to be able to have a single tool where they could actually manage from a DevOps perspective without actually having to re-implement all the code. So Envoy is, is highly recommended. It has a bunch of uh, solutions in that space. Uh, an alternative is Linkerd, very similar in terms of architecture, different implementations. You can actually do sidecar deployment or uh, on a, de a deployment per host, so a single, a single uh, uh, Linkerd on a machine, uh, or you know wrap every single service in your own Linkerd. Uh, if you want to go, uh, you know a further layer up, Istio, which is a platform that both uh, uh, Google, IBM, and a few other partners are rallying behind, which is basically is ba built on top of Envoy, Envoy being the, the uh, you know, the service wrapper, but the Istio brings uh, basically a control plane API so you can actually do, uh, manage those systems, uh, very interesting. Uh, it's Kubernetes and it's based on Envoy, as I said, sir. So you can easily deploy this in your environment or in the cloud. So imagine that you go through, uh, you know, all the process of deploying load chaining in, in your services, right? What, what's the impact, right? Why do, should we do all of that work? Um, so I have three use cases. So one of them is the basic one, like reliability. Uh, but even though this was not our original uh, goal, um, we realized that this actually had a huge impact on utilization. Uh, utilization really means very good usage of your resources. Uh, this used to be something that uh, maybe even 10 years ago was not a concern for a lot of people because you bought hardware, I remember in my IT uh, uh, professional career before joining Google, uh, I rarely saw a machine that had uh, more than 20% CPU utilization. And if you had more, somebody will go, oh my God, the machine is overloaded, we'll buy another one. Um, at Google, it's different. Like 20% uh, uh, is basically uh, waste. Like the machine is like, we want them really at 80, 90, right? CPUs are there to be used. So we pack stuff, we run stuff, you want, you know, ideally 100%, but there's always uh, some stuff. I know that uh, our cluster management team, they're actually, you know, overbooking, like, oh, this machine has 18 cores instead of 16, and then we schedule and stuff like that. Uh, so we really want to push the machines. But also, nowadays in the cloud, you're actually buying VMs with a specific CPU count, and you're paying for it. So, uh, you know, you really want to use that hardware. So why should you run your tasks not at the absolute maximum that you can without dying? Uh, that has, you know, money implications, some serious money implications. Um, so we found that utilization is actually one of the biggest impacts of uh, load chaining. Uh, specifically, I don't know if you remember that first slide that I had in terms of the allocation margin, because uh, 
you buy machines, we call CPU reservation internally, um, but there's that circuit imagine that is never used. And at the same time, we actually have all those pipelines, those map reducers. They also got you know machine uh, machines bought for it, and because everything needs to run somewhere, and they also have a little bit of a safety margin. Uh, and you have all of that nice empty space that you're paying for, which finance just goes, can't we do something about this? Um, so we actually found a way that if you merge them together, like they're using the same machines. And uh, just so you guys understand, actually, I flipped the capacity used by the, the map reducers. Uh, and if you combine provisioning, but also at the same time, you say all my map reducers are going to be on the low criticality. So if my workload goes, uh, you know, combined is more than the total capacity, I'll just, you know, I'll just ignore that workload. I'll just defer it. You know, I'll reject. I'll serve my user critical, and you know, we'll defer that workload. And and then I can run my map reduces my pipelines, my reports, my data mart stuff at trough at full speed and use all of those CPUs which are empty because the users are asleep. Right? So this is something that is like super, super uh, useful from even from a business financial provisioning capacity point of view. The second one, uh, so that was the, the, batch, uh, the, the batch handling. And the third one is around product level and service level decisions. Uh, I believe this is the last slide. Um, so we basically, you know, you can now, if you know that you can launch a service that will not die, if you know that you can actually have traffic that we will not serve and the users are not impacted, you can actually say, I can provision below peak traffic. You can launch a project for which you don't have enough hardware and it's going to be fine. Uh, and this is something that you can actually decide on your own. You can basically take just 10% of your traffic and the rest you can go, sorry, uh, but do good job on the 10% that you accept. Ticketing uh, com companies do that a lot. They gate, they gate the number of people that are able to buy tickets, like when there's big events, and then they just reject all the rest. Uh, but also from an operational point of view for the DevOps in the room and SREs in the room, it really transforms what are emergencies into mere problems. Because if your service is not dead, then you basically uh, can survive. You know, and then defer, and you can sleep, and then handle it in an hour. So thank you very much. I hope this was useful.